Joy Division. And tonight I want to really focus on his second wonderful book, which I just reread, about New Order. So, um, are you okay to talk about that? Who? <laughs> New Order. New Order, yeah, 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 yeah. Go on, give it a go. Give it a go. Um, so, you start the book, really, and one of the th things I immediately picked up in the change from Joy Division to New Order was the use of technology and your interest in technology. Was that the case? Uh, yes, it was the case. It was misguided, it, largely, um, because I'd spent far too long watching programmes like Lost in Space and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, which had computers that did everything, and I thought, I, I remember buying one, and I, I, feedback. I, was, I bought it because of the advert, which said, uh, got, need, got problems, here's a problem solver, <laughs> buy the Tandy ZX, whatever it was, computer, and I thought, considering our plight at the time, that we'd had a lot of problems, and this promised a lot more than it actually delivered. Yeah, well, one constant theme in the book is technology not working. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it was, it's been, uh, it was a letdown. It was a complete let, letdown, really, because you, know, you, could, you could see a future where, you know, people go about in jet cars and stuff like that, and the idea that you would one day have a telephone that also took pictures never occurred to me never occurred to me but I was convinced that technology would make music you could use it as a, as a tool for the uh, less musically educated which sums me up really. But it did work didn't it? It did it did, yeah. it did. Um, yeah it, it, it did but again not in it was it was more our enthusiasm for it and we stuck we stuck with it really we could have very easily when I first took the Apple II computer to the New Order, New Order rehearsal room and said, listen to this, lads, it plays Fur Elise by Beethoven. And what bloody use is that? And I, I hadn't thought it through, really. I, I thought I thought that something that could play something by Beethoven could easily be translated into a, a top ten hit or at least a toe tapper. Um, but again, I hadn't thought it through. But we stuck with it. We stuck with it. Was it mainly you, or mainly you and Bernard in the initial stages? Um, it, it was me reading the manuals and Bernard asking why it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and did that come through? So initially, did that mainly come through in the percussion element of New Order? Because um, you certainly hear that on movement. One of the immediate yeah, differences from yeah. Joy Division. Is the, is, is the percussion? Yeah, I mean that was the, that was the first thing that was quite easy to do was to do uh, rhythmic things on it because um, it was in Joy Division uh, where Martin Hammett sold us our first little drum machine, which we never got to use in Joy Division. It was a two for one offer. He was buying one, so <laughs> if we get to it, it'll be cheaper. And that was sort of the first port, port of call uh, was using synthesized rhythms and we built on that really so um, t to me the key difference obviously obviously there's no e in but the key difference obviously is when Gillian Gilbert comes into the band and it surprised me in the book to read that that was Rob's idea yeah it's very far-sighted of him um, yes it was it was um, I mean, they, they, I, I, I do cover it in the book as, as, well, as well as I can remember it, um, that Rob just rang up one day. I mean, we'd all had gone through this thing, oh, what have we got to do? Well, no, but nobody wants to be as the singer, and nobody did want to be the singer because we'd, we'd had a great singer, and we, you know, we, we knew that none of us could do that. Um, and so there was this big question mark, and Rob just rang up one day and said, oh, I've been thinking... Uh, well, it was Gillian to join the band. So was, what? <laughs> um, and Gillian, did I actually ask you? Did I ask you? Yeah, to go round and ask you. <laughs> Do you want to join the band, Gillian? And um, on the trial basis only, much the same way that 
I joined the band on a trial basis back in 1977, and I've never told me I got the job. Yeah, um, and some, somehow it kind of it made it made a sort of sense that we weren't um, thinking of really that that Bernard had started singing a bit, but he couldn't sing and play guitar at the same time. So initially it was like, well, Jenny can play guitar and Bernard can sing and then you can do the keyboards as well. So that was how it happened. But that was the key, in, to me, that was the key difference between Joy Division Yeah, two yeah, it was. That was kind of why yeah. the book stops where it does stop, yeah. the first one, yeah. and the second one starts where it does start because it's like the, the New Order really started when Gillian joined, I think. And also, n not a lot, I mean, ACR had a female vocalist. Yes. It, but but not many Manchester groups at the time would have had a woman in the group? No. Oasis wouldn't later. No, 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 <laughs> not, not, a, not, a, not a, apart from ACR, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're right. So, I mean, that, that was a wonderful thing to do. Yes, yes, it was. It was, it was the right thing, and it was, it was Rob thinking outside the box. So, so to me also, a big, a big turning point in, in the early days is, I always loved it, was everything's gone green. Yeah. And you write about this a, a lot in the book. And you found a way of actually mm. making a tune out of the synthesized yeah. percussion. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, it was just, got a synthesizer, got a drum machine. There's this little lead, goes in, trigger in, trigger in, trigger out, trigger in, something like that. And then you go, well, yeah, play anything. And it's like, it sounds just like Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> you know. Shortcut to success. That's that's what I thought. I mean, you couldn't do you couldn't do much with it, but what you, you didn't could, need well, you, to. You didn't need to. No. I mean, it did myself out of a job because I did it. It sounds fantastic, but you don't really need anyone playing drums on top of it because it sounds so good on its own. So I thought I shot myself in the foot somehow. So who played what on that? Did Gillian play guitar? Or did Bernard play guitar? Uh, blimey. I'd have to have a look at it. Can you remember? You, pl you played guitar. You did the synthesizer. Bernard did the guitar. It was, it was a Vox, Bean's old Vox guitar. Well, that's why it sounds so... That, that's why it sounds so... <laughs> Razor-like. Um, I eventually realised that you should only play the drums at certain intervals. And... Um, Hockey did the bass. That was, that was it. And Bernard did some singing. That was the start. That, I mean, that was really the start of it. Everything's gone green. Because you listen to movement, and Bernard's hardly there in the vocals. No. He's sort of whispering. No. The, I mean, the, the thing about movement is, if we'd have carried on, um, it could have been a completely different record. Because when we got to the end of movement, we, we, we did everything's gone green as part of the same sessions. Um, Martin sacked himself <laughs> at the end of it, and. It, then that was it then, we were, we, we were off. Because uh, it, Martin did have a really hard time, uh, well we all had a hard time doing movement, but um, Martin in particular didn't, he sort of didn't know whether we should carry on, and he, 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 he took um, Ian's death. Very hard, didn't he? Very hard, you know, much harder than he would let on. And uh, I think he, he was quite emotional about it, but he never, um, well, he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't tell you how to play the drums, so telling you how he felt about Ian would be asking a bit too much. Yes. <coughs> so in, in a way, listening to that early phase of New Order, particularly after jo Joy Division, Joy Division can be very claustrophobic mm. and, and heavy, whereas in New Order, or even on movement, particularly of, from everything that's gone green, you're wanting to find space. Yeah. The space, it starts to open up. And, and part of that is, is the technology. Part of that is suddenly finding a new life, a new member, Gillian Gilbert. But also starting to travel. So New York is a big influence. Yes. I mean, that was the first thing, even before Gillian joined, the first thing we did was we went, we went to New York. And it was hearing... Um, a lot of early hip hop disco records on the radio in New York, and the sort of idea it would be really great to do 
something like this, even though, you know, none of us understood disco or, you know, it's terrible, terrible business, this disco music. But it, 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 would, it had a certain energy about it, and I think it was... Burnham was listening to it as well, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But Burnham in particular was listening, with this, he'd, got, he'd taped stuff off the radio, and it was just sounded fantastic. Because there's a wonderful bit in the book where you say, I started to move away from my old staples of prog and rock albums and began an uneasy relationship with records I formerly had considered possibly mistaken need to be disco. That's right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I started buying records that didn't have gatefold sleeves and sort of like wizards, mi wizards on the cover <laughs> and went from, you know, things that had absolutely no sleeve notes at all, no lyrics, just the title of the artist and a very bad photograph. So did you hear sounds in those records you wanted to reproduce, or was it the feel of them? <sighs> well, it, it, initially it was, it, was the, it was the feel of it. Um, I mean, another sort of thing that I should point at as a, a, a reference which gets um, neglected is, is that uh, Blondie's Heart of Glass yes. was like, Huge wouldn't, hit. wouldn't it be great to do something like yes. Heart of Glass? Um, because that was kind of like a bit rocky, but it had that sort of like bit of disco, but it wasn't... It was Maroda as well. Yeah, it was, yeah, that kind of thing. So did you like I Feel Love when it came out? Um, do you remember it? I do remember it. I, I, I liked it. and I liked it. It's, it was weird. It was, weird. it was weirdly hypnotic, which is what I liked about it, and the fact it was very, very long. Yes. Um, yeah, I liked that. It was a game show. That's the record that put me off punk. I thought that's not fu that's futuristic punk, isn't it? it yeah, it, it was futuristic, very futuristic in a way that punk wasn't futuristic. It was kind of like taking the past and mangling it up and like, there you go, made something new out of that. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> but you had a bit of, you did have a bit of electronic disco in Joy Division, a little bit touches of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's, <laughs> yes. Uh, d d John's referring to the syn drum synthesizer, which I got, which was an early experiment. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, um, which was really only designed to make one sound at a time. Um, but I found two sounds on it that, that Bernard particularly liked. But unfortunately, um, you've got this thing and you've got to twiddle a knob. And um, twiddling one knob was all right, but, but I couldn't twiddle two, so there was early performances of the song called Insight, a bit of the, I remember at the band on the wall um, were deafening, they, you'd have this sort of quite nice melodic song and then uh, a load of stormtroopers from uh, Star Wars would suddenly appear going <laughs> very loudly uh, and everybody would look at me as if it was my, well it was my fault because I couldn't turn two knobs at the same time <laughs> Um, so when, when do you think that New Order has been you know, that really started to find your voice? Was it with Power Corruption and Lies? It was Power Corruption and Lies, yeah. really. Um, because we do, uh, as I was saying, we did movement. When movement was finished, we did Everything Has Gone Green. We did Temptation, which was like a refined yeah. Everything Has Gone Green. And we started with the same, but with Bernard had a synthesizer, he built this little sequencer and we started doing little synth bass lines on that. Um, so we wrote uh, for most of, well... Blue I don't, Monday was before Park Rock, wasn't it? Was it that was the same time, same time. Same time. Um, <laughs> we'd, we, we'd been writing the stuff sort of out live, like we all stand, we'd done, we'd done... Um, they were just ideas, but it never got finished off. And then, sort of, just before we went into the studio to do it, we bought this thing called an emulator, which was a sampling keyboard. I mean, we don't, we, Martin's big thing with Factory and one of his big arguments was he always wanted to buy, Tony or Factory, to buy a Fairlight, yes. which was like, it's fantastic. You have the price of a mansion 
or a you know a Ferrari, and it was a keyboard, and you could just put sounds. You could record any sound and play any sound into it, but it was hideously expensive. And oh no, we won't do that. We'll buy a club instead. We're not buying that. So we bought this cut price version of that. It was still very expensive, called an emulator. Um, which, uh, as soon as it turned up at the rehearsal room in Cheaton Hill, oh, oh, what can you do with it? Give us a microphone, and you know, we just started recording farts on it. And I was like, this is brilliant, isn't it? They can play farts on a keyboard. So we got that, and then we got um, a polyphonic synthesizer and a polyphonic sequencer, neither of which we really knew how to use. And then we went into Britannia Row, Pink Floyd Studio, on our own. Uh, and started doing Power, Corruption and Lies, in the course of which we, we literally rewrote everything. Oh, we got a new drum machine, that's right. A drum machine that sounded exactly like a real drummer, which like, <laughs> did wonders for my self-confidence, I can tell you. Um, yeah, so we went in and we rewrote everything on this new equipment. And on the way to the studio, we'd come up with this idea of writing a tune that played itself, um, which was one of the excuses for why did you write Blue Monday? Um, it was just, we got this gear and we wanted to know how it worked uh, without necessarily reading the manual. So we just sort of wrote a song. And that was the first big hit? That was, thanks, thanks to, um, yeah, northern people traveling to Spain and drinking far too much sangria, that became a big hit in the discos <laughs> of Spain and it came back over here and, you know, thank God, you know. And you also did around that time, you did a wonderful, going back to the Moroder Pulse, you did Video 586, which is <laughs> 20 minutes of Moroder Pulse, it's fantastic. That, that was... If you've it, never heard it, it's absolutely it, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, um, and it doesn't, I'm not going to say who it doesn't feature, but it doesn't. Um, I mean, that was just before we went in to do um, Power, Corruption and Lies, uh, was we'd done, we, we were still on the Rinky Dinky drum, that was a Rinky Dinky drum machine and a Rinky Dinky sequencer, and um, we were going to do this gig at the Hacienda, and um, we wanted to do, make a video to go on the screens, at that. we had video screens at the Hacienda, so we, you know, we, we me, Bernard and Gillian went into the studio and just said, well, let's just make a big, long piece of music that's a bit like the way we played 586 at the time. You know, how long, I don't know, 15 minutes? So we just started it going, put loads of dub on it, just made a big, long, dubbed-out version, and then went, went and cut uh, a video um, with Malcolm Whitehead. Yes. And then it was forgotten about until somebody put the tape on and a few years later I thought it's fantastic and decided to call it Video 586. I played it in the car today. It yeah, did you? Yeah, it's great it, it is good. It is good. <laughs> uh, it wasn't it wasn't you know it wasn't designed for public consumption like that, but it's good. It's good. <laughs> so after Blue Monday and with Park you find your voice with Park Corruption Lies after Blue Monday you start to have success and there's a wonderful bit in the book where you said we were an outsider group who happened to make music that appealed to much broader audience than just the weird or the peculiar. Hmm. Uh, so that must have been quite a big change. N not only you became successful not only in the UK, but certainly in the dance charts in America. Your records yeah. regularly went into the dance charts yeah. from sort of 84 onwards. Yeah. Was that a huge change for you? Um, yeah, it was. It was because uh, over here you were still sort of like the band that used to be Joy Division but weren't anymore and when we went to America nobody knew who Joy Division were so they didn't they didn't make that connection and they were a lot more uh, receptive they'd come and dance to you and they didn't wear Max and, and scowl at Gillian like what they got her in for um, <laughs> well they did at first it was kind of, it was kind of like oh. um which I thought was a good, which I, I particularly going back thought that was a good thing because it, um, it annoyed a lot of die-hard Joy Division fans and it was like, well, if they don't like it, we must be doing something right in yeah. a very perverse kind of way. And then it, it, in America, it was, 
yeah, it was great to get away from that. I'm just looking at the charts. I mean, Blue Monday was number five in the US dance charts. Yeah. Confusion was five. Perfect Kiss was five. Mm -hmm. Shell Shock was 14. Yeah. State of the Nation, four. I mean, these are big yeah. dance records. Big dance records helped a lot by the fact that we never appeared on American television. <laughs> <laughs> That's a myth, surely, that Blue Monday went down after you appeared on Top of the Pops. I think you'll find it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find it's true. Okay, was Bernard drunk or just nervous? He was just nervous. He was just <laughs> nervous. So, I mean, we, we, looking back on it, it was a completely ridiculous idea. I mean, it's a very noble idea, or it was at the time, to play live on Top of the Pops because it was like, <gasps> oh, you know, but it was missing the point because Top of the Pops was an entertainment program. It wasn't necessarily a, a rack program. Um, but to then insist on playing live a song which was barely live at all um, <laughs> and, and was basically played by a machine um, was sort of like very, very perverse indeed. And it was, it was inevitable. We'd make, we'd make a mess of it. And we did. Well, I did. I mean, it was my fault. I put the wrong disc in. Press the wrong button. Well, it was memorable, Steve. I mean, it was great TV. How many John? people remember it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you see. Well, thank you. I remember it. <laughs> I was there. Were you mortified? Mortified. Yeah, I was mortified. <laughs> Shall we do it again? No, it'll only get worse. Let's just leave it, leave it. <laughs> That's a good motto. Shall we do it again? No, it'll only get worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. And I think it was, it was Bono, somebody, maybe it was Bono, I can't remember, the guy came up to us, so I really think what, that we wanted to play live, but they wouldn't let us, it's really good what you guys are doing. Right, okay. <laughs> so, did you sort of concentrate more on, I mean, in America you started making videos, a mm. lot of videos with eminent directors, Michael Schoenberg. Michael, Michael Schoenberg, well, what happened is, after Power, Corruption and Lies, going to America a lot. Um, we ended up signing with a major label in America because one of the problems we had in America and with Factory in general is that they didn't have distribution and uh, you know, the whole, what do you call it, holistic now. It was all bits and pieces all over the place. Didn't and, nation, what nation, yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> Uh, Mar the, the, the point was Michael and Tom Atencio was sort of doing it, and then uh, so I got signed to Warner Brothers. You know, yeah, little feet are on Warner Brothers, um, and um, then he said, "Well, Mo, uh, what do you call it?" This guy, yeah, well, Quincy Jones. He's doing a record label. Do you want to sign to Quincy Jones's record label? I said, yeah, 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 because Rob was really into the idea. Thriller. Yeah, it's Quin go on Quincy Jones's label. So that's how we ended up signing to Warner's through Quincy Jones. And that things started changing then, because up to that point, we'd been die hard. Um, no singles on albums sort of thing. And that's the first thing you've got to do if you're going to get, if you've got to do anything in America, lads, you've got to put a single on the album. And uh, the other thing you've got to do is put your picture on the sleeve of your next record. Um, and I think they were actually thinking, putting a picture of either the band or was, usually it's the singer goes on the front. How come it was you, Steve? Well, I took the best picture. <laughs> <laughs> it cost me a lot of money. No, no, um, we, all, we all took turns um, because we couldn't, we couldn't, it was impossible to take a picture of the four of us together because it would just be useless with someone would be laughing. And we'd, you know, oh, we'd all be looking miserable, and that wouldn't sell records. <laughs> um, so Peter realised this, and um, we made appointments like going to the dentist to have your picture took. And he loved mine. He loved my picture. He said, "You're you're, you're, you're going on the front, Stephen." I hope there was no resentment. Well, there was a lot of resentment later on from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because when they invented the compact disc, um, they, they, they put cards in so you could have whoever you wanted yeah. on the front. 
Well, she's very democratic. I go, I, I go along with that. It's a very democratic thing. I'm not really, you know, that's that old myself. But I did get very annoyed when I would go to HMV in the Arndale Centre and find that every copy of Low Life had got Bernard on the front. <laughs> and that annoyed and you me. You checked. I changed them. I went through and bloody took the things out and put, corrected the error. And nearly got done for shoplifting, but that's, that's by the by. Yeah. So you say on Low Life, three of the tracks had exclusively electronic drum parts. So you really were moving into... Yeah, yeah. We were getting... It was getting more and more elaborate. Yeah. We were getting, you know, skilled in the overproduction of drum parts. But it, it becomes much, much more of a light, much more of a pop sound. You become a pop group, really. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it was still a bit of... There was a bit of heavy metal on Sunrise, sort of like an yeah. and then, But apart from that, Perfect Kiss is, like, very, very poppy. Um, yeah. Yeah, we were, we were steered in that direction. Although I do find bits of it quite dark. Um, low life theater, probably because it was made largely in the dark and we would go around um, clubs in Soho and it's got the Jeffrey Barnard oh yeah quote title, yeah. yeah which is where the title came from and we would we would just well he was a wreck he, yeah well that's how we were most of the time <laughs> we would go out um, yeah but you were 50 years younger <laughs> really <laughs> you were, <laughs> I didn't feel like that. He looked terrible. Yeah. I used to see him and he was really broken down. Yeah. yeah I'm we, sure you still had the blush of youth. Yeah, you. well, we used to look at it. Like, that's, that's, that's how we're going to end up, you know. And, you know look at us now. A vision of health. A vision of health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you write about... 1985 is a year. 1985 is a big kind of change. You're investigated mm. by the taxman. Rob Gretton has a breakdown. Yes. The, the nature of which is never really um, totally explained. It was explained in the factory book. I, I knew Rob quite well. Mm. I wasn't seeing him then. He totally changed. And Rebecca joins as well. Yes. Rebecca comes in. Uh, Rebecca Bolton, your current manager. And you write in. You, you write very well, actually, about women. Mm. about the role of women and how, how sort of male-dominated factory was. Yes, it was. It was. And there is actually, I'll, I'll, I'll plug a book that isn't out yeah, yet. Audrey Golden's book. Audrey Golden's yeah, book, yeah. which is very good. And it does correct a lot of historical mistakes. Yeah. Um, because basically, there are, a bunch of, there are a bunch of blokes who get credited for the success of factory. But that <laughs> wasn't, wasn't success. it wasn't successful at all. <laughs> In fact, it wouldn't have achieved anything or gone anywhere if it hadn't been for the Tina and Tina and, yeah. and Leslie were there. So they actually making things happen because Tony had swung about and tell people what they were doing, and then they'd, they'd just get on with it. They wouldn't really take it terribly seriously. If it, hadn't, if it hadn't been for the the ladies of factory, nothing would have happened. Well, for instance, Leslie Gilbert supported Rob. She had the job and she was supporting yeah. Rob Gretton, the, the manager, at yeah. one point. And also, if it hadn't been for Leslie um, keeping everything, we wouldn't have the Rob Gretton archive in, yeah. in the genre. Leslie's Rivers. book as well, is if you can get a copy of that, that's fantastic. And I mean, these are just t two examples. Another mm. example is Deborah Curtis. Debbie's book. If she hadn't kept everything, um, we wouldn't have the Ian Curtis notebooks and lyrics on loan in the John Rylands, which we currently have. So there's this really weird, even on that level, there's this really weird dynamic that the men swanned off and messed up. Yeah. And the women <laughs> kept everything. Kept everything. But Tony did. He really yeah. did. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time with Tony, and he wasn't great with women. No. No. I don't know the uh, put up with him half the time. And Rob as well, but I mean, yeah, it was a different time. And you write also about, very well about Julian in the band. There's one devastating line. I suppose the problem was Hooky and Bernard didn't quite know how to talk to Julian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a problem because, you know, you've, 
There was a bit of um, a bit of New Order that's forever mired in a 1975 sitcom, and you know it's in the grammar school. Yeah, grammar Bernard school. Bernard well, Bernard well, yeah, you know, yeah. And um, part of that was you know. You, you go and ask her, you ask her, you know. Give her, you ask her to put her, you, will you make a cup of tea? <laughs> you know, it was really that bad. Um, and it was, yeah, all male education establishment, so yes. a, 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 a lot to blame for that. Um, you, you would have thought as time went on that there would have been a bit of enlightenment. I mean, Rob was, because Rob just came and took the piss out of us equally. He didn't, he didn't discriminate between Bernard Ucky, me, or Gillian. You were, you, were, you, were, you were all... Fair game. Fair game for I Rob, remember. yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, which was, yeah, it was a great, great thing. He did, Rob did keep you grounded. But he could be very kind as well. He was incredibly kind, yeah. Yeah. That's what people. That's what people don't see. Yeah, yeah. No, the people think he was um, a football hooligan, which he was, but not in the sort of football hooligan sense that you would. He liked football, and he was, yeah, you know, a was big a, bloke. He was a big bloke. He, you could, it was easy to say that about him, but he wasn't. He was the least um, violent person. Um, I can think of, although he is the only other person I've been in a brawl with, but never mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it wasn't me, it was the rest of the band. We, we, it was one a trip to America. Um, we, we stepped in this the, the Iroquois Hotel, which was next door to um, the Algonquin, Dorothy yeah. Parker's. Something down. We were in the bar at the Algonquin, and we were, it started off the, and the entire band was in there. And you know, oh, we get around and get around and get around and get around. And then so they slowly trickled away till at the end of the night, there was um, me, Gillian, Michael Schamberg, and Rob, and a very large bill, and no money. <laughs> so, we, so, like, we somehow managed to scrape together enough cash yeah. to cover the bill and like, there you go, just leave it there. Michael Schamberg helped himself to the shot glass and I was remembering walking out with the shot glass in his pocket and uh, the barman of the Algonquin um, was apoplectic, he was enraged you guys have stiffed me. You've stiffed me because you had to leave a tip. I mean, we didn't know about leaving a tip. You Australians, you come back in my butt. <laughs> I'll never serve you again. And he, he just he jumped on us. And Michael Schamberg put the shot glass on the side and put his briefcase down and didn't know what to do. And then uh, Rob and the barman started brawling. In, uh, and I joined in. Like, like you do, it was uh, pointless and unfortunately what happened is um, we, it ended with Australians being permanently barred from the <laughs> bar at the Algonquin and um, Michael Schamberg left his shot glass and briefcase outside and we had to go back the next day and say, has anybody handed in a briefcase? <laughs> yeah, that's the one time I saw, I, saw, I, saw, I saw violence. But also, Rob, the, the thing that comes across from his archives, and, and um, I'm sorry, I don't know quite what state they're in, whether they'll be, but they should be made pub, uh, available to the public soon, is how much he thought about everything. He planned. He did, yes. He did very, very meticulously. He kept records of things. And he, he, always, he, always and he had a vision as well. He did. He, he, did, he, did, yeah. have a, he did have, he did have a, a plan for the way he thought things should go. But to be fair to Tony, Tony did, because I remember Tony saying to me after, he had moments of clarity, and he said to me, uh, amongst all the mm. froth, because he could talk a load of bollocks. Yeah. But he said to me after Ian had died once, we were going, he was in his, he had a red Peugeot estate with a cracked window. Yes. And he always had bits of wire and amps and stuff in the back of it. And we were going somewhere to deliver an amp. And he said, John, you know what's going to happen, don't you? He said, we've lost Ian but they're going to be like Pink Floyd without Sid Barrett. They're going to go on and sell millions of records. Yes. He that, did. That, and he actually, he, so they no. both had, 
had that vision. Yeah, no, that was um, Tony's first thing. That was this power, corruption, and lies vision, and his sort of low life vision. Because he, Tony, got seduced by um, American record companies. They said, like I said, about Little Feet, and he was like yeah. meeting all the people who you'd, you'd seen on the back of your records. And uh, the next thing was, yeah, well, you got, you, you, one of the, one day you're going to be sitting around a swimming pool in Los Angeles sipping cocktails. And it was, <laughs> it's never going to happen, that. So <laughs> never. No, trust me, trust me. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, it was right. So going back to New Order, you do also, you, you write very well, particularly at the end, about the dynamics of being in a band. And you're very philosophical, which is mm. actually very refreshing. There's no backbiting or whatever, there's no edge. But you do talk about the hierarchy and that, mm. so in Joy Division, you were the newest member. Yeah. It's the same as in the Beatles, Ringo was the newest member for yes. a while and he had to earn his place. Yeah. So you were the newest member because it was Bernard and Peter Hook yeah. and then Ian then and then Ian. you. Yeah. And then it was Gillian after you. Yeah. So in a way, you talk about the key hierarchy in New Order for a long time being Bernard and Peter. Yeah. Was that the case? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's, it, it's, um, it's a, another rock cliche of two boys, you know, two little boys, you know, meet at school and form a band, and that, that's it. And then later, they hate each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's classic stuff. Um, because a lot of the language that they were using reminded me of the schoolyard. I thought, well, we're, is, back, in, we're back in Salford in yeah. 1970. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing never really moved on from that. The, 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 yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but there's still something that, yeah, is in a playground at Salford in, in, the, in their relationship, or there was in, in, in the band. But I mean, now it must be completely different now. Um, yeah, because yeah. Because you're, you're, you know, you're not. It's not the latest to join. No, no, no. We don't, we've passed it. We've passed it on. Someone else has to brew up now. Tom. Tom has to make <laughs> make, make the tea. Um, yeah, that's the hierarchy of the bands. You know, the last one in gets to work the kettle. <laughs> I don't mind working the kettle. I don't see what the what what the what, what the worry about working no, the kettle. No, I, I know, but it's just one of those band things, isn't it? Um, so, you know, there's a lot we haven't covered, um, but you, did Rob, Rob's illness make a big difference to, to the group? Yeah. Because yeah. he sort of held you together, didn't he? Yeah, it was, it, it was a great, it was a bit of a fracturing, really, because, yeah, Robert, you'd always thought of Rob, and I still think of Rob as being kind of like your dad, some sort of father figure, and he was sort of like, big. He, always, he always seemed to be older more mature than he actually was compared to us. He was like, you know. There was three years, he was three, four years. Yeah, then, yeah, that's all, but he seemed much older than that. He was like the designated driver, and, you yeah, know, we had a plan. And to suddenly see that he was as. Um, it was a kind of weakness, really, and he, it, it kind of cracked the, what you thought of him. Yes. R really, to see that he was kind of vulnerable and he could make mistakes. I mean, we knew he could make mistakes. We knew Tony we could have well made mistakes. The whole factory thing was based on sort of luck and making, making mistakes. But it kind of is after his breakdown. Um, it, was never really the, it was never really the same. And I think Rob, yeah, Rob was never the same after that. Um, yeah, some, some, something went, uh, and it wasn't, it's easy to say, oh, it was, it, he had a bit of a breakdown. I mean, he did, but he was actually ill. Yes. He was, he was, very, he was very seriously ill, and um, that's, he wouldn't admit it to himself, I think, that he was, because it would be like, it's the same, it's you know, another sulfur prager and northern man thing, you never... You know, it's a sign of vulnerability to admit that you've got, yeah, you know, weakness. I'm not a big tough guy, and he would, he wouldn't, he didn't go in for that at all. Did it change the relationships in the in the, in, the, in the group as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course it did, because we were sort of like um, 
stuck w without a manager for a bit, and um, we didn't really know we didn't really know what to do. Um, Tony tried helping out, and that didn't really work. Um, we were just it just went a bit sort of like a bit directionless. Because after after Brotherhood, it took you a while to make tech, um, not technique. Yes, yes. Technique. Yeah, technique. Yeah. Which is much more is very technological and housey. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, that was. I mean, I think the reason technique is like that was because it was. I mean, when the, the making of Brotherhood was a very weird time because Rob was just normally he was very big and boisterous in the studio when he was kind of... He was a bit on the first day, I can remember him having a, an argument with U2's manager, because we went to... You got the as you, do, you, as got you the, do. You got the tax laws changed, didn't you? <laughs> um, his, and... Um, but most of the time he was quite, he was quite withdrawn. And then... The tax thing came to a head, and it was, it, it, and it was sort of felt like everything was over, the hacienda suddenly seemed like it might be successful. You know, and it and might you be had good. an exhausting American tour. Yeah, we did a massive American tour, um, overdid it. Yeah, um, yeah we, we overdid a lot of things, but we had a great time doing it. Um, so we're going to whiz through, I'm afraid. So oh, sorry. No, 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 no. it's... Um, it's, um, I mean, when, so you stopped after, after Technique for a bit, you come back with, um, with Republic, yeah. which has got Regret on it, which is yeah. one of my favourite New Order songs, yeah, a wonderful really, song. Yeah. Um, but that's the end of it for a while. What happened? Were the cracks in the group beginning to appear? <sighs> or was it just the hacienda of the factory going down? Well, it, it, it was kind of like, uh, we made a lot, a lot of mistakes doing technique, going to Ibiza, spending a lot of money. It, made, it was a great album, um, and if we hadn't have gone to Ibiza and spent a lot of money, it wouldn't have been anything like that. But then, um, yeah, things started going very, very badly wrong at the hacienda, and Factory weren't making any money, and I always remember one of the things uh, Robin told me saying, there's a reason that Factory's not doing very well, it's because New Order haven't made a record, yeah. so bloody go and make a record, and it was kind of like, it didn't, it felt like you were, I think in the book I say, as a hamster on a wheel, it felt like you were, you were, you were being forced to be creative, and you can't really... But you were also being responsible for about 30 people. Mm. Yeah. 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 Instead of your, just, just yourselves. Yeah, and so we went to, into the studio and me and my Happy Mondays had gone to do, had done exactly the same thing that we'd done <laughs> on um, technique and only they'd gone to Barbados and ended up in a, I don't know, whose studio? Was it Eddie, what do you call it? Eddie Grant's, Eddie Grant's, um, and, and a crack den around the corner anyway. It was bound to end in failure. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, most of Republic was spent with having meetings. You'd, you'd, you'd just, oh, oh, this track's really coming along, it's sounding, it's sounding good, oh, you've got to have a meeting now. Right, lads, uh, we need 40 grand by tea time or the Hacienda's going to close. Uh, it's, really? And it's kind of like, it's a bit of a downer, that, really. I was, I was of the opinion that let the fucking assy end of clothes. You know, I'm not coming up with 40 grand by tea time. You were outvoted. I was outvoted. About this yeah. yes. um, so that was done in, um, after, in ba badly remembered um, records, well, making of records, Republic's number two, I think, after movement being number one <laughs> that the, the, yeah there was a lot of very bad vibes man so you do say in the book there was a split between bernard and peter not necessarily just down to their relationship but also peter wanted things to be more rocky and live and yeah didn't, didn't see the point of yeah the yeah no that, that i'd always been, that i'd always been there in the background because 
like when we did video 586, it was me, Gillian, and, and Bernard, and um, my Oki felt excluded, and even there was always, I think he says it in his own book, but it was him, it's me versus the machines. Those damn machines may make my life a misery. And that's fine. You know, but that's one of the great things about New Order was there was always this sort of balance between yeah. sort of rocking out and sort of intricate technology. And when the two worked together, they were fantastic. But when it becomes, well, it's, it's the machines or me, it's kind of not, <laughs> not, not really going to work that as well. But in a way, that's what you've now pursued since 2011, which mm. is that mixture of rocking out and yeah, I've gone back to got, and, got and back also to dance music. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was... When you get the two things working together, it's great. Um, and sometimes it's great to do all one thing or, or the other, but usually it's the um, bit where the two merge, the way it, it, it gets very interesting. That's, that's what people want. That's yes, that's yeah. What, that, yeah, that's kind of like what contemporary music is nowadays. And when we got when we did Music Complete, it was great to write songs like that again. So you've just done a tour with the Pet Shop Boys? Oh we've just done a tour with the Pet Shop Boys. Lovely lads, lovely lads. <laughs> they are, they're nice. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you've got, you, you've got half the audience being the gays and half the audience being the rock fans. I hadn't quite thought of it like that, but yes, now, now you mention it, perhaps that was the case. No, it, it, it was just like, <laughs> yeah, well, it was great doing it with the Pet Shop Boys because we could go on early and go to bed early. <laughs> and sometimes it was the other way around, so it sort of worked, depended on the city. So what's in the future for your new order then? What's in the future for new order then? Well, Rebecca. <laughs> you, you've just done some dates in, 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 uh, in America again. That's right, yes. Yeah. We've just done some dates in Texas helping Andy Burnham to launch his new festival, which will be coming to this town next year. So go along to that. That would be great. And um, meanwhile, in New Order, we're going to um, carry on treading the boards. Uh, coming. Well, I, we, I think we are actually going to, and some people may be pleased about this, play some dates in the United Kingdom. Yes, unfortunately, one of those dates isn't going to be Norwich. If there's anyone hoping for a gig in Norwich, I was. But once again, Norwich is overlooked. <laughs> what is the, the Mustard Museum? Oh. <laughs> so, also, we've been talking to you, and I know that we've only just begun talking to you about something else, which is something that you and Gillian have kept together again this involvement um, of, of keeping your archive. Yes. And, you know, we would hope at least to, to get some of your materials on loan in the... I'm trying to give it to you. <laughs> Please take it away. Well, it's... <laughs> it, <laughs> well, you want it tidied up first? It I mean, we all know... That it, I was explaining to an audience earlier that actually archives take a long time. Yes, they do to come in because it's an emotional, what people don't realize is that the emotional factor is a major part of it. Mm. And so, you know, we're used to dealing with, that's one of the major factors Hannah and I and Matt and John Hodgson deal with in, in collecting archives. But anyway, we'd, we'd really hope to have some of your materials in the John Rylands. Um, and for instance, also, we're hoping to get um, Cozy Fanny Tutti's archive, we talked to, we, we yeah, talked cool. to her, I bet got which would go with the Delia Derbyshire archive. Yeah. So, so we, you know, we, yeah. we, that would be really good. My collection of old crap is rather paling into it. We could take our science fiction magazines. Oh, we could, okay, yeah, all right, fine, we can do that. And we can take prog rock LPs. Right, okay, all right, you're making me feel better. <laughs> right. Plenty yeah. of, plenty of, plenty of, um, any covers with wizards and sorcery. Yeah, well, I've got a box full of that shit. Yeah, you can have it. I want to end with just a quote, which is the, right at the end of your book, and it's an absolutely wonderful quote, and if you want to say anything about it, do. But it, it, it also reflects how I feel in my own memories of the time. That something I was part of for an all-too-brief period at the end of the 1970s has become something far bigger 
than any of us could have hoped or dreamed of at the time. Mm. That the idea of joy division is something that today transcends the music we produce is something I find both humbling and absolutely staggering at the same time. Yeah. That really, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. You've, you've, uh, you've, uh, I mean, when they, uh, when they wrote that, I was just, uh, you know, I was back in Strawberry in my head, you know, re recording Bubble Tears Apart with Martin and, and all that. And it, it, it's kind of like, this is probably as good as it gets. We didn't even think that, but there was no, you didn't think, you know, in 40 years' time, there'll be a big picture of Ian <laughs> on the wall somewhere, and uh, you, you wouldn't be able to go into a pub in Macclesfield without seeing a picture of Ian uh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's very, very strange. And the Wavy Lines t-shirt, you know, the, 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 does that make a good t-shirt? No, we don't do any fucking t-shirts, it's a bad <laughs> idea. And now that's like some sort of shorthand it's a meme, I'm not sure, but it, yeah. it, it means something by, by, by itself, uh, has taken on a whole existence that was utterly, utterly nowhere in our heads in 1979. The, 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 whole, the, the whole thing, and yeah, I'm, it is very humbling. It's, fun, it's absolutely fantastic. I don't, sometimes I can't, quite, I don't get it myself a lot of the time. I can see it in other bands. I can, I, I can, I'm like a, a fan of a lot of other bands and I can see why people do it, but I can't see <laughs> why me, why us? Um, but thank God they do. Yeah, no, it's great. I am very grateful. Well, what I'd like to do now um, is um, hand it over to you. Um, any questions from the audience, please. And what I've been asked to ask you, because we are recording this, is if you could ask your, put your name and ask your, ask your question into the microphone, please, when it's, when it's, um, when, when it's, it, when it's produced. produced. When it's produced. So if somebody would like to get the ball rolling, this is always the hard bit. Because any it's questions? Like, it's like you're back at Come school on. and yeah. nobody wants yeah. to start. Yeah. Please, sir. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, fine. Oh, no, 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 there's someone, there's someone, there's one, some brave soul there, put his arm up. Come on. Always ask the first question. Um, hi, uh, my name's Kieran. Um, Sorry, can you turn it up a bit? Is that better? That's yeah. better. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Kieran. Um, okay. So, can you say a little bit about the experience of writing for you? So, moving to writing the books, what that was like? Um, uh, was it cathartic? Was it confusing? Um, writing the books? Uh, yeah, very, very cathartic. Um, very enjoyable. It was absolutely nothing like I thought it was going to be, because I thought when you write a book, it would be exactly the same as reading a book only the other way around. I thought you'd go, once upon a time, and like after an indeterminate period of time, you would have written a book, but it's not like that at all. There's this thing called editing, and it involves crossing out a lot of what you've, you, all your marvelous, you know, words of wisdom are just trash, and you just chuck <laughs> them in the bin, and you start again. But I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. Um, one question I am asked is, will you ever finish it? And yeah, probably. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's good. Everyone, everyone should have a go at writing a book. And did you find it easy, Stephen, to get a, to a tone, or did you have to work on that? A voice, an authority no. voice. You just, you just put it down. <laughs> I, yeah. You just bashed it down. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that was easy. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other Please questions? Hello, there's a of you. Yeah, this is, this is, apart from... Oh, there's another one. There's another one. <laughs> Hi, my name's Paul. Um, back to Joy Division New Order rather than the book writing. Um, I was at the Derby Oil gig, and then I was at a very early New Order gig, and kind of being young, I kind of probably stupidly thought you'd be playing Joy Division songs. So my question, what I've thought about forever since back then is, how easy or how difficult was it to decide to basically ditch every song? Because you, you're very creative in the latter period of Joy Division, all the way through, but in that latter period. And then you, you, you decide to not play any of it for Donkey's Years and write a whole new set and then 
you know, present that to the audience who are idiots like me who are expecting you to still play Georgian songs. Mm. Uh, how easy? It was very easy and very stupid uh, because it, it, why would you do that? They were, they, 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 were, they were great songs. I mean, we kept Ceremony in the only place because, I mean, they, they hadn't really become Joy Division songs, so that, that was all right. Um, in a way, because, it, in some strange sort of way, because that was, you would, didn't want to denigrate Ian in some way, that that, that, that was all over and you, we were going to do something, it, it wasn't trying to get away from it, 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 was, it was trying to, you know, we're going to have to start again. It would, it, it would have been really easy to get, let's just get another singer in, you know, do this, oh, just do all the Joy Division songs. And I think if we'd have done that, we wouldn't have lasted very long at all, because you know, yeah, you'd, you'd have always, you would have always have had that. They're not as good without Ian, are they? And we didn't want to be put in that position where it was Ian versus the band. It wasn't fair. So, and it was Rob was very vehement. And he said, "You should, do, you should just don't play those songs again." Um, I don't know how many years it lasted because we did start playing Lovell Towers apart a few years after that and we did revisit them. It wasn't strictly true. We never played them. We just never played that set again. Um, yeah. And didn't you play quite a lot at the Apollo? Was it 96? Yeah, like we, yeah, we did do that. Yeah. We, yeah, that we, it was 1996 was kind of like when it felt like it, it was all right to do it. Right, yeah. play a few songs instead of just the odd one. Thank you. Any other? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hannah's got a question. <laughs> I'm really. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, right. Sorry. I should hold the microphone closer. I'm really interested about the way you describe writing, but also the way you describe music making. It, it, it's. It, you've got very. It, it sounds so unplanned you almost suggest that you stumble across things that you're mucking about with machines and you make some sounds and that sounds nice oh you thought you'd write a book so you have a go at writing it and yeah. and and i'm just comparing that with some uh, modern pop stars or musicians who seem to have plans mm. really lo long thought out plans and vision whereas you present yourself as as never having had a real plan is is that right <sighs> largely yes <laughs> <laughs> um it, it's not complete tomfoolery that you you're just mess, mess, messing about with something i mean it stems from how, uh, from how we started off as joy division and that none of us could really play an instrument, apart from me, of course. None of us could really play <laughs> an instrument. We didn't really know how to write songs. So the four of us in the room learned how to write songs. We learned how to become Joy Division. And it was all, um, you know, it was somewhat spot on. You would just, you would just amble along doing like 15 minutes of rubbish and suddenly there'd be like 10 seconds and everybody would look at each other and it's like, you know, that's it, right. Just play that again. And then you think of another bit that went with that bit. So there was a bit of planning, but the initial thing was spontaneous. I mean, the, other, the counter to that is that someone turns up and goes, hi guys, here's a song I've just written about. You know, I, I just need a little bit of a middle eight there. And you know, but we couldn't do that. We, 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 we'd no idea what a middle eight was. Um, yeah, that's how it worked. I mean, it, everything has sort of been built on on that, apart from Bernard had some singing lessons, Jimmy <laughs> had some piano lessons, and that's it. There's a gentleman behind you there, Hannah. 
Hello, uh, talking about just following on from that, uh, when your contemporaries started adopting your sounds, obviously, um, how did you feel about that at the time? Because obviously it's quite flattering probably looking back now, but at the time did you feel that, ooh, that was a bit, maybe The Cure, remember that song by The Cure, what was it, that, with uh, mm. Lee Monday, there was a bit of beef about that at the time? I'm, I'm growing up now, <laughs> in, some, in some respects, I, I, but I can remember at the time, um, being a little peeved about it, <laughs> yeah. You know, but you can't. It's only bloody music, after all. There's, 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 there's twelve notes, and like you just, uh, the, the, the rhythms are sort of like pretty predictable. And it's, it's just how you put them together, really. And it's it's a it's a form of expression, um, and. In a way, I'm sort of more, uh, flattered now that so someone's out. In fact, we heard one the other day, didn't we? Just last night, someone played a song which was virtually um, shadow play. You know, and it's kind of like, this is shadow play. But like, I didn't get enraged about it. I thought, it's quite good. It's, it's, it's you know, someone's took it and they've turned it into their own thing. But we'll sue them anyway. <laughs> So I'm not that annoyed. But, but, uh, didn't Bobby O do a rip-off of Blue Monday? Oh, did we rip off Bobby O? Um, yeah, yeah, Divine. With, with Divine. Divine's <laughs> love reaction. That's right. we, yeah, which we actually did, we did a cover version of at one gig. We did, we, instead of doing Blue Monday, we did a love reaction. <laughs> um, with the roadie pretending to be Divine. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> Any more um, questions, That's please? Oh, good. Oh, we, 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 we could be thick and fast now. Oh, yeah. hey. oh now you've got to have the mic. Here you go. Thank you. You mentioned um, something that Peter Hook had said in his book. So I just wondered if when you were writing your book, you were conscious that the others might read it and that made you think carefully about what you put in it. And also, if you read the rest of Peter Hook's book, was there anything in it, or, or maybe even Bernard's book as well, was there any, anything in, in them that sort of surprised you and you maybe wished you'd known at the time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I started reading both of them and, like, um, put them both down. Because, I mean, even read, I read Debbie's book as well, and the trouble of reading books about in which you feature, and also the same thing in films, because there's been a couple of films in which you feature, is, as you were saying about getting annoyed about songs, um, I do get annoyed about that, because it's like, that's bloody wrong, that never happened. I never played the drums on the roof. I never played the drums. Uh, people always ask me, did you play the drums on the roof? No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to, to be fair, everybody remembers things differently. Everybody gets things wrong. Everyone's got their own opinion on it, which is fine. But I couldn't really read somebody else's book and then write a book of my own because it was like, I've got, I've got to, you know, it's mine. So there you go. And I'm sure Peter's felt the same when he did this and Bernard felt the same when he did it, which is great. Yeah, you've got to do that. But um, I didn't think there was, a, there was not much mileage in... You know, and in Peter's book, he said that on the 31st of July, <laughs> I refuse to make a cup of tea. <laughs> this is complete and utter bollocks. There's no point in taking that approach to, you know, literary scholarship. Yeah. But also, you might have memories implanted. Oh, yes, very much. By other books. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much. I mean, there's that, the whole thing um, about writing the book is realising... <laughs> Um, how much of your memory is, is it confabulation or I can't remember, how much of your memory is actually made up, you've, you've, you, you remember certain key facts and you fill in the blanks and you, the, the bits that you filled in you'd swear you know, your mother's life actually happened but when you actually look at um, the internet for instance you realise, or a calendar, you realise that it's hit it's historically impossible to have happened the way you remember it. Um, yeah, that was interesting as well, that you, your mind is very, very fallible. 
So were there great chunks out of the time you couldn't remember? Well, yeah, I did, I did smoke a lot of pot, and I did do a lot of things, so, so obviously there's bits I can't remember. <laughs> Luckily, I kept a diary. <laughs> Any other questions, please? There was somebody else, yes. Uh, you talked about the relationships going a bit sour between Technique and Republic. Did Bernard going off doing his electronic stuff make that worse? Uh, well, that's another great rock and roll thing, isn't it? The, the solo album, which happen, happens to us all. Um, did it make things worse? Uh, I think it was something that had to happen. Um, and I think possibly Rob thought it was a good thing, maybe because it would sort out um, problems and everything would be all right. Um, but it didn't, really. Um, no. Uh, yeah, so maybe it, it did make things worse. But, yeah. In fact, she got another record. Well, they got two records out of it, didn't they? Yeah. Could we have one more question, and then we'll um, go, on, go on. We'll uh, adjourn for book signing downstairs. Stephen, how big a challenge was it when you took the students uh, on the tour using the pods to the to the band? Sorry. How big a challenge was it at the international festival tour? Oh. When with the students in the pods doing something completely different. What doing the Manchester International Festival? Yeah, and yeah. The Vienna gigs and things like that. That was a challenge. That was um, it was. Yeah, that was a challenge. All right. Um, now would have been. It was really good. Manchester International Festival was great. It worked out really well. It would have been really good to do more stuff, you know, it's a character carried on, but, but um, the, the thing was too elaborate, it was, it was too elaborate and we couldn't, the, the, the nearest we got to doing this cut down version is we did one night in Miami where we did the sort of similar set only without the string players and it kind of wasn't really the same, it, it just became big production. Um, which was part of it, which was part of the whole spectacle of it. But you couldn't do it. <laughs> you couldn't do it in a little club. You can, you know, it just became. It, it was a, a thing in itself, and uh, we could possibly. Do you want to? Do you want the set? Do you want to put the set in your archive because yeah. the Manchester International Festival are looking for somewhere to put it? We can store and, stuff in it. And my barn's full, <laughs> <laughs> so we can make little models of it. Yeah, it would be nice to do more stuff like that, I have to admit. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you all Thank very you. much for coming. Thank Stephen you. will be signing books downstairs. Do we know where? Where the pile of books are, I should imagine. Just by... <laughs> just by the table with the books. The on. books will be Table away. with the books on, just yeah. by the entrance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't miss it. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Enjoyed that, Stephen. Thank you.